Now in this video, I want to talk about the chemical and physical characteristics of the water molecule, which give its amazing properties, which will help support life. You probably heard about the fact that the water molecule is called H2O, and that's also the chemical formula for the water molecule. That basically means it's got two hydrogen atoms connected to one oxygen atom in covalent bonds, in a molecule. And that's the molecule that you see over there. It's a compound of two hydrogens and one oxygen. And before we can talk a little bit about water, we have to talk a little bit about chemistry so we can understand what's going on over here. Now, of course, you know or should know that everything that you see around you is made up of these elemental particles of matter, which we call atoms, which are the smallest particle of matter that retains unique physical and chemical properties. Now, when you look at the atom, what basically it is, is a nucleus, which has protons and neutrons in it, which are subatomic particles. The protons have positive charges, and they repel each other, and that's why you need the neutrons in there. And the overall, the nucleus is going to be positive because of those protons. And then you have, surrounding that nucleus, attracted to it, you have negatively charged electrons going around in circles really, really fast in what we call the electron cloud. Now, what makes an atom different from another is the number of protons and electrons that it's going to have in it. The more protons you have, the more electrons are going to be attracted and orbiting around that nucleus. And that's what makes up the different elements. And you see here the periodic table of elements, which shows these elements. And the elements are different depending on the number of protons and electrons that it has. And the physical characteristics of the elements are going to be determined by the number of protons. And that basically means the way the element is, the way the element looks, the way it behaves. And it all has to do with the physical properties, which is determined by the number of protons. That is the difference between the different atoms, or the different elements of the periodic table, uh, the number of protons. But the way the atoms act chemically, or the way they interact with each other and do what we call chemical reactions, or form compounds, has everything to do with the electrons that each atom has, especially the last layer of electrons. Speaking of which, these electrons orbit around the nucleus in what we call energy layers. Now, the first layer can only take up to two electrons, which is why hydrogen and helium, which only have up to two electrons, hydrogen has one, helium has two, only have one layer of energy. But after that, all the layers will end up in eight electrons. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. The sub-layers, the last sub-layer, will always end up in eight electrons. But when you look at that, in general, they follow what is called the octet rule. Now, depending on how big this atom is, how many protons it's got in its nucleus, it's going to attract more electrons, meaning it's going to have more layers. That means the number of layers and the number of electrons in the last layer is going to vary from atom to atom. For example, this atom over here, you see, has three layers, and it has only one electron in its last layer. While this one over here will also have three layers, but it will have eight electrons in its last layer, and that guy over there will have seven. So each of these atoms will have different chemical properties because they have, they have a different number of electrons on their last layer. Now the interesting thing about atoms is that they want to be what is called electronically stable. Because look at this atom over here that has that lone electron in its last layer. Wherever the electron is, it's going to have a transient charge because that side of the atom has a little more negative charge than the other. Now of course this electron is going around in circles really, really fast. But wherever the electron is, the negative charge goes with it, so it's like the, the negative charge is fluctuating around the atom cloud. And that actually causes electronically instability for, for the atom. So, and it causes magnetic disruptions and all kinds of problems for the atoms. So in order to stabilize their clouds, atoms will engage in what is called chemical reactions to gain or lose electrons in order to stabilize their clouds. So they don't have a side that's more negative than the other. Like the second atom over here on the right side has the same problem because it has one less electron. See, it's this electron missing over here compared to the other side. So it's also going to have a transient charge. But this guy over here is perfectly balanced and is not going to have a, a transient charge. And so that is how electrons need to be in an uh, atom that's electronically stable. So this means all atoms will engage in chemical reactions in order to stabilize their cloud. And they will do so by gaining or losing electrons, which will form ionic bonds, or by sharing electrons to form covalent bonds. Now that you know that, you should be almost ready to talk about water. But before that, we have to talk about the idea of electronegativity. Now, an atom that is almost complete, that has a shell that is like, oh my gosh, only one or two more electrons and I'll be completely happy. Like this atom over here, all right? 
this means he only needs one more electron to be completed. He's desperate to get that one electron. Meanwhile, this atom over here, if he wants to complete this layer, he's going to need seven more electrons. Because remember the octet rule? The la every layer past the first layer needs eight and the last sub-layer to finish it. So he's not going to get seven more. There's no way he's going to do that. But it's easier for him to do the opposite. If he loses this electron over here, then he loses that last shell, and then he goes back a shell, but that last shell is going to be completed. So some atoms will be givers of electrons, and we'll call them metals, and they're going to be in the left side of the purity table. Others will be takers of electrons, and we'll call them non-metals, and they'll be on the right side of the purity table. And we have, whenever you have a metal and a non-metal tie to talk about, they'll probably make an ionic bond. And sometimes you get two non-metal trying to talk it out, and that's when you form the covalent bonds. Now, if you want to learn more about that, watch the chemistry lecture series, and you'll learn more about these things. But what you need to know to understand water properties basically, is that depending on the structure of the atom, it's going to be likely to take or give electrons. These guys on the right side of the periodic table are going to be the ones which are desperate for electrons. And the ones on the left side of the periodic table will be the ones which are willing to give them up because of the structure of their last layer. Notice how the ones on the right side need a few to complete, while the ones on the left side need a, to get rid of a few to be completed. Now, this means that there's a pattern on a periodic table of who is hungriest for electrons. And the pattern kind of looks like this. The top right side of the periodic table will be the ones that were the most hungry for electrons. And this is what we call electronegativity, or how desperate I am for electrons. And the reason why the top is more electronegative than the bottom on the right side is because if you're smaller, you have just a few electrons, you're even more desperate to get electrons. If you're big, you know, which as you go down the periodic table, the, the elements get bigger. Yeah, you don't really care. One more, one less. What's the difference anyways? You know, the opposite is true when you're trying to give them up. If you're large, you're like, ah, go ahead, take it. I don't make, it doesn't make any difference. But if you're small, you'd be like, ah, I only have one. So it makes a big difference for me. So that they're all, everybody on the left side is going to be giver, but the ones in the bottom will be giving up even easier. So this explains the electric activity pattern that you see in the periodic table. Now let's talk about the water molecule to understand what's going on over there. Now, if you look at the water molecule, it's going to be the bonds between oxygen and hydrogen. This covalent bond that forms actually separates the hydrogen ions by about 104.5 degrees. And that's how, how distant they are from each other. And it's just a random fact that that's very important to know about, but it matters in advanced chemistry when you're starting to study this. It forms this little triangular shaped water molecule. Now, oxygen is a non-metal, and hydrogen also acts like a non-metal, so they're going to form covalent bonds. Neither wants to give up the electrons that they have. Definitely not hydrogen, because he only has one. So he says, if I give up electrons, I'm not even an atom anymore. I'm just like a proton, like moving around over here. So he's going to want to share electrons. And oxygen wants to share as well uh, electrons to complete its cloud, in this case, at least, because he's not going to be able to take it. But even though he's going to share the electrons, because oxygen is on the right, top right side of the periodic table, it's going to be hungrier for electrons. Meaning that when it's sharing the electrons with the hydrogen, it's going to keep the electrons most of the time. Now this is actually very, very important because what it means is that the electrons will tend to spend a greater amount of time around the oxygen end than the hydrogen end. Meaning there's, they are polarized towards the oxygen end. These electrons will be attracted more to the oxygen than to the hydrogen, meaning there's going to be a partial charge on the oxygen side that's negative and a partial charge on the hydrogen side that's going to be positive. Now, this makes the water molecule act a little bit like a magnet, and that is the thing that's going to give the water molecule its amazing properties. So, water molecule is bonds to hydrogens, to one oxygen. The reason you need two hydrogens is because each hydrogen can only donate one uh, or share one electron with oxygen, but oxygen needs two to complete its cloud. So you need two hydrogens to satisfy one oxygen. But it's going to be sharing, but unequal sharing. So this means while overall the charge of the water molecule is zero, there is no net charge. There is a polarization of the charges. There are partial charges on different areas of the molecule. The oxygen side is going to be negative, and the hydrogen side is going to be positive. 
and this makes the water molecule a very very polar molecule and it's actually very specially polar because the water molecule has what we call the oxygen which is what we call the electronegative queen the thing about oxygen is that it's one of the most electronegative elements that there is the only element more electronegative than oxygen is going to be fluorine over here on this side of the periodic table He's the only one that's more desperate. He's so desperate, he sometimes even steals electrons from noble gases, which are the ones which have the cloud completed and avoid doing chemical reactions. Now, oxygen, though, is more common. So even though fluorine is the enemy that you don't want, you know, it's like the tiger you're really scared of, you're actually more scared of the robber because that is more likely to be a problem for you. So oxygen is very common in the surface of the Earth. So it's going to be the electronegative queen that's going around trying to steal electrons from everything. That's actually going to be very important in biology later as well. Now, the thing about that, though, is now that you understand how each molecule of water looks like, you can try to start to understand how the molecules interact with each other. Molecules are attracted to each other by a variety of ways. In the case of covalently bonded molecules, they attract each other in what we call weak van der Waal forces. Now, these are just attractions between molecules. They're much, much weaker than, than covalent bonds that hold the molecule together. So there's, this is going to be intermolecular forces. In the case of the water molecule, this connection between the molecules is a special type of van der Waal force which is stronger than usual. It's still going to be weaker than covalent bonds, but it's much stronger than other kinds of intermolecular attractions. We call it a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond occurs between the hydrogen of one molecule and a, an adjacent molecule that has a very electronegative atom like fluorine, the king of electronegativity, oxygen, the queen, or nitrogen, which is the knight of electronegativity. And sometimes you also get chlorine. But these three, absolutely, fun. I, that's how I remember it. These guys are going to be the atoms which are going to be the most electronegative atoms, the most hungry for electrons. Now, whenever you have a molecule that has one of these atoms at the corner of a molecule, and then an, an adjacent molecule has a hydrogen near it, an attraction force, a special type of attraction force, will occur between the adjacent molecules. So you see that happening in water, because water has oxygen, which is one of the three, and then hydrogen on an adjacent molecule. So even though oxygen is already happy, paired up with two hydrogen so it, it's cloud is electronically stable it's so electronegative that it's going to go ahead and try to steal electrons from this hydrogen as well that's going to make this attraction force here a little stronger than a regular intermolecular force making water because it's so polar act like an even stronger type of magnet that holds the bonds in between the water molecules even more than in other typical molecules do so these bonds by the way are still weaker than covalent bonds. They're very weak compared to covalent bonds that actually holds the atoms within a molecule. But it's still going to be stronger than most other kinds of intermolecular attractions. And each hydrogen bond is very weak. But if you put the hundreds of thousands of bonds that it will exist in a liquid water when you have a cup of water, you're talking about thousands of thousands of these bonds which give the water its amazing properties which we'll talk about in the next video. So. Because water is extremely polar, it will act like a magnet. And because it has an extremely electronegative atom, oxygen in it, and it has hydrogen in it as well, it can make a special type of intermolecular attraction called hydrogen bonds, which will give water its amazing properties. And we'll talk more about that in the next video. And also remember that when it comes to water molecules, and it's not going to be the only thing that's going to be hydrogen bonds in biology. Hydrogen bonds will form in proteins, it will form in DNA, and will form in a lot of other things in biology, and they're going to be important uh, for a lot of different ways. So remember, a hydrogen bond will form between a hydroelectric negative atom of one molecule and a not hydrogen of a, an adjacent molecule. All right? In the next video, we're going to talk about this high polarity of water, and these hydrogen bonds help give water its amazing properties.